First things first, congratulations on the Wicker Tree. Oh, you like it? Yeah, I did. I saw it at the um, the Empire last August at um, Fright Fest. Oh, you saw it at Fright Fest, yes. Yeah, it was, it was great to see the film play to a, a packed house at the Empire. And, uh, well, I was there, and yeah, well, and I I I was really I really enjoyed that festival. I don't usually enjoy festivals, but I thought those guys ran it so well. And they had such enthusiasm, and the films they shot, I thought, uh, they shows, I thought, were very good. Um, and uh, I, it was really a terrific scene. Um, but um, they, they, uh, I think, how to put it, they got the film, they understood it immediately. Yeah. Uh, and it has been shown here. Uh, to audiences of you know, film salesmen who have not been told that it's a black comedy and think it's a horror film. Yeah. <laughs> they sit there in appalled silence waiting for something horrific to happen. Yeah. And um, uh, it, uh, I, I've rather go out of my way to introduce the film and I think obviously that's the job of the, of, you know, the advertising and all that or the poster or whatever. But, um, uh, if you go into it expecting it to be particularly a classic British uh, horror film, I mean, there's a pint of blood in the first five minutes, isn't there, normally? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway, I mean, it's, it's not that we haven't got horrific moments in it, because I think we have. Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, I, th- I think that's one, that's one of the things. That I think um, it's a film that deserves to be seen by audiences yeah. who are open-minded. I mean, it is... Thematically, it's similar to, to the Wicker Man, but at the same time, in time, you know, it's a very different film, as you said. Um, it's, it's it's very funny for one, and I mean, of course, you hear about a film by Robin Hardy called The Wicker Tree, um, and featuring an appearance by Christopher Lee. And I think it'll be it'll be kind of impossible to um, not to have certain expectations. But I think yeah. part, part of the fun of The Wicker Tree is actually having your um, expectations defied. That, that just, that's he's... a very, that's a very good comment. A very good comment. Yes, it is. It, you're, uh, one is one is happy as the filmmaker to reward you for, for having liked the Wicker Man <laughs> and and come back for more, as it were. Yeah, I, I think that you know it do, that doesn't happen nearly enough in cinema today. I mean, so often people just they know what's going to happen in, in films, and it, it's it was so nice to actually leave the film and, and want and you know have to think about what you just saw I mean it was, it was refreshing there are, there are filmmakers like the Cohn brothers who uh, who always do something utterly original or nearly always so that that's that's the continuity in their in their work I think um, uh, it, these two films of which we speak um obviously a similar in genre, uh, and the one I'm about to make up in the Shetland Islands, God willing, um, uh, is will complete this cycle of three films which are in the same genre. But I do understand why the film business has some, has some problem with it, because you know there's a, a well-known Christopher Lee quote uh, on the film, um, originally made on the book when I wrote it. I'm talking about the Wicker Tree. Um, he said it's you know it's comic, it's erotic, it's romantic, and it's terrific enough to melt the bowels of a bronze statue. <laughs> um, you know, wonderful sort of Christopher Lee hyperbole. <laughs> <laughs> but it, that just describes the genre, doesn't it? I mean, it's all it's all over the place. It's a genre, um, and that's the fun, as you say. So the film, uh, The Wicker Tree, is based on your novel, Cowboys for Christ. Um, That's right. What inspired you to write the book? The book was interesting. I'm trying to remember when I wrote the book. I think I, think I wrote the book about... Uh, six years ago. Right. Six or seven years ago. I've, I've got the exact date. And um, I suppose I had a film in mind when I wrote it, but uh, and not terribly specifically. I mean, it, it's a novel I'm quite pleased with it as a novel. I mean, I've written other 
novels, and I, I, I like this one. Um, uh, and on the whole, it's been realized in the film, in so far as one can. You know? Yeah. So would you say that The Wicker Tree is more of a spiritual follow-up to The Wicker Man? Yes, I suppose that's right. Um, I mean, in the sense that uh, the genre, the, it's, it's, okay, if I can make homage to my own genre, it's uh, <laughs> uh, homage to the genre that we created in The Wicker Man and, and want to have another go at to see if it still works and if it works with audiences in the way it, it did for the first one. Uh, in that sense, it has a sort of, it's a sort of spiritual brother, I, I take your point. Speaking of Christopher Lee, what was his um, initial reaction to the script when you approached him? And I, I believe you um, originally intended to cast him in the role that, that was eventually um, given to Graham. Well, he, he actually read the book, you see, because he gave me a review for the book, which is what I quoted to you. Oh, yeah. So he knew pretty much what was coming. Um, and um, uh, I think I think he was all always quite happy with playing Lochlan, which is what he was intended to play. You know the lad, um, but he then went off and made a film while we were, you know, getting things together in Mexico, and had a nasty accident and hurt his spine very badly. Oh right! So that, and he had all kinds of treatment for that. It's very difficult for him to stand for any amount of time. And of course, he's not in the first flush of his youth. He's well, when we made the film, he was already eighty-six, um, and so I was a bit. I'm more than a bit concerned that he will be able to last the course of the entire film in terms of of all the standing and you know, rushing around that he had to do. And so we agreed that he would just do a vignette. Uh, and I'm quite pleased with vignette. I think it works. works fine. What do you think? It's it's more of an, an, an appearance than anything else, but um, it's certainly, I think, an integral part of the story. Do you think that... Um, uh, it's a good thing to be ambiguous about who he is. Yes, I think I think it adds to the um, the kind of again, as as I mentioned, is a film that leaves you thinking. I think it kind of adds yes. to the mystique of that. <coughs> yes, I agree. That's uh, if you're going to do a cameo like that, you can't do it simply to get the character in, you know, for the for the billboard. Yeah, absolutely. It's got to have a real purpose, doesn't it? I mean, I, th- I, th- I was listening to um, an interview actually that Cri- um, Christopher Lee did at the, I believe it was the end of last year, and and he said he's, as he's you know, he's, you know, he's limited with his with his time um, these days, that he only wants to do, um, you know, small roles that that do have a, that that are an, are an important point, um, an important part of the story, and I think with as far as the Wicker Tree is concerned, um, that that that's absolutely true. I absolutely agree with you. He, I mean, and, and and he was made to do that because the extraordinary thing about Christopher is that when he's on the screen, you can't look at anybody else, really. <laughs> he, he has extraordinary screen presence. Um, I mean, that's why he's a sort of star. I mean, uh, and um, uh, he, he, it's wonderful to work with him because you know that when you you put him there, you've got something something really potent going on, uh, almost regardless of what he, what you have given him to say. Um, although, of course, he, he says he says it very well. And he's got that wonderful voice, um, that sort of deep, brown voice of his, um, which uh, I tried to have on the soundtrack before he actually appears, so you think, uh, who's that? Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> He certainly uh-huh. commands the screen. So um, obviously, the film was given the title of the Wicker Tree rather than the book, um, which was Cowboys for Christ. Was the title changed to help sell the film? Well, I think it was a bit of both, really. Um, uh, certainly, uh, the, um, the Cowboys for Christ thing uh, had problems in the states because uh, when, we, when that was the title. Um, because we had one investor who was going to put quite a lot of money into the film withdrawal because he was worried about a film with Christ's name in it. 
No, yes. Um, Americans um, uh, are rather more extreme in that way than than we are, um, and um, so that that influence is a bit because we didn't want to alienate you know, a great piece of the American audience, um, although it seemed absolutely stupid to the you know, It's far from an anti-Christian film. It's you, know, it's you pay your money and you take your choice, really. I think. Yeah. Um, but. Um, the other thing was that um, uh, I saw a tree, not unlike the tree that we we eventually created, um, and I thought it would be fun to have a uh, a wicker icon, uh, which was as striking, perhaps in some ways, as the wicker man. And so uh, uh, I, I, my art director, designed that tree. Um, and I think the guys who made it, who were uh, sort of woodsmen from down um, Freeway, did a marvelous job. Uh, but they, they do quite, um, they they do the um, effigies, or whatever you like to call them, for the Wicker Man Festival. They make new Wicker Men to be burnt every year at the Wicker Man Festival. Oh, right. Uh, and in Galloway. Uh, and... Uh, what is wonderful about their work is they manage to put sort of movement into them. And these people almost look as if they're dancing, don't they? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that's the that's the skill, absolutely. Of the all I did was a sort of sketch um, of you know, two figures sort of coming together to, and rejoicing, and and they've absolutely got it. I think. Um, I'd like to have one put in my garden, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, it looks definitely looks um, very good on 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 the screen. Yes, I think uh, so. It, well, the way you mentioned there, the the, um, the title change, I think that's actually quite ironic, um, given you know the, the the film story. I mean, obviously there's the culture clash in the film itself, but then there's the kind of grinding between Christianity and and paganism. And I think that kind of you know there's quite a lot of irony in there about. Um, you know the, the themes of of religion in the actual film, and then there you have an investor who is is worried about the um, you know the the religious aspect of the original title. Yes, it is. It is ironical. Um, uh, irony isn't the uh, great forte of our cousins across the Atlantic. I don't think. <laughs> uh, uh, although that's not really fair, because I think Woody Allen does a pretty good job. Yes. <laughs> Ironical. Um, uh, in fact, a very good job. Um, so it, it, it's not an exclusive for us, really. But um, uh, I, I, I mean, I'm glad you like the jokes, but I think the jokes, jokes are quite funny. What did you think of the of the um, uh, of Lolly? Have you seen her in Boyle's War? I haven't. No, unfortunately, I've, ne- I've never. I've never seen the. Um, the you series. might be intrigued to, if, you, if you happen to switch, be switching on the, on the, tel- on the television. To have a look at more well, 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 because she is goody two shoes. You know, she the butter would melt in her mouth. And, uh, uh, she's a really nice, nice lady. And then, of course, she plays this. She loves playing the opposite in the, in the film. It was great fun for her. Uh, and every now and then she would say, oh my God, if my granny could see me now. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine it was quite a refreshing role to play. Yes, indeed.
So having having not directed a feature film since I believe it was the the Fantasist back in the mid eighties. Yes. Um, what was 90s, it? Nineties. Nineties. Oh, oh right. no, ages. You're right. You're right. Sorry. What was it like to actually step uh, step back behind the camera? Well, I've done quite a lot of television in the states in the, in, in the intermediate. Movie. Oh right. Yeah. I mean, I you know um, various sort of, I did a sort of series of biographies for BBS and things like that. Um, I'm not. Uh, it, 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 it wasn't all that unfamiliar to me. I mean, I I felt perfectly comfortable from many one. The only problem was that I'd never used uh, one of these huge digital cameras, <laughs> um, which actually, in first experience, are considerably more difficult to work with than, than you know uh, film cameras, um, and um, and present all sorts of problems of their own. But of course, the results are very good, and the things that you can do with the material afterwards are very good. So, um, what, what was it like? It was like um, uh, familiar, but faced with some intriguing new technical problems, which I hadn't faced before. Because in the intervening years, I used well, I used um, digital, but not on this scale. Yeah, I think. Um, I mean, the whole. The landscape of filmmaking is changing quite, um, and at a, at a very brisk rate. Yeah, I mean, quite often these days you've got directors who, who sit, I mean, two two hundred feet away from the actors, or and in, in it, uh, or in an entirely different room, you know, glaring at monitors and, and giving directions um, through a walkie-talkie. Yes, as I said, it was, it was familiar territory, but at the same time, quite different. Um, do you think it was different for the best, or? Well, I think in the end, for the best, from the economic point of view, because what you can do with the material um, in post-production is is really awesome. Whereas um, the shooting experience is not quite as pleasant as as travelling light with, you know, a thirty-five millimeter Arriflex or uh, a camera like that. Um, it's not as flexible, right. uh, and you have, you know, you you can get a situation where you have uh, something like double the crew you feel you really need oh, yeah. monitors, monitors all over the place. <laughs> um, it's, <coughs> I think, once you're really familiar with it, you can cut it down to size. But the trouble with, in a way, with all the wonderful things we can do with CGI and that nowadays is that um, people like, you know, playing with it like a video game and forgetting that they're making a story. <laughs> um, and it's a temptation because, you know, there's so many possibilities yeah. that are thrown out. I mean, one, one of the sort of um, obvious ones is that uh, every time you're setting up a major scene and you've got a truck sitting on the horizon, um, one of your trucks, and uh, you know you're shooting a, a hunt as we went in the bigger tree. Um, you say, you know, to the assistant, well, "Will you please get that truck out of it?" They say, "Don't worry, Garth, we'll take that out of the CGI." And that happens all the time. <laughs> when you get to that stage, you find yourself taking it in the walls about quite expensive time, <laughs> which you can save by simply getting someone to. Drive the bloody thing out of frame. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but as, you, as you mentioned earlier, um, you have one more film to come um, that yeah. it, it, in your, um, I guess, genre trilogy. Um, what can, that's, I believe, Wrath of the, the Wrath of the Gods. That's correct. So, what can you tell us about that film? The Wrath of the Gods is set uh, now. I was set in Iceland, but I reset it in Shetland. And as you may know, Shetland is. Um, uh, full of Scandinavian people, not Scots. Oh, yes. But it was ruled from De from Denmark for something like five centuries. And so uh, I'm setting um, the, uh, a, uh, a film of life, and the gods here are not Celtic, they're North. Yeah. And um, the film is about uh, the gods getting their come up. In a way, it's a fitting third film. Um, uh, you know, 
it's more like what happened in the the ring cycle, the Blair Bargner's ring cycle, which is based on the same the same set of stories. But the gods in the end have to go back and and hide themselves in Valhalla, having you know, messed up so many people's lives if <laughs> on Earth. <laughs> Uh, and um, so my my godlike characters come to the, to that sort of end in, in this film, and and I'm greatly helped by the fact that they are a one they got a wonderful sort of far um, a far celebration um, uh, sequences which they do up there uh, with marvelous costumes and all that all that's going on for real you know so yeah uh, if I can to weave my story with the, with, with the real thing. We'll have a, a lot of production about it. Well, excellent. Uh, definitely sounds intriguing, and um, I look forward to it. Well, me too. <laughs> and um, I can't wait to get, to get up. And having got the filmmaking bug again, I think it's going to <laughs> take me out of this. Eh? <laughs> Excellent. Well, um, thanks a lot, Robin. It's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. Thank you for your, for your call. Thanks so much.